Hello, everybody, and welcome. Hello, Mandy. Hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. You look fabulous, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you as well. I feel like, you know, I'm in character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Mandy and I, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We realized we hadn't done a Q&A in a while. It's been a little bit busy, and we thought, well, geez, we miss it. We want to talk to everybody. And then we got these really cool Kigurumis, these costumes from Kigurumi.ca. Yeah, so Kigurumi.ca, so CA, the lady who runs it, uh, it's Maria Pham Beaupre. So thank you so much. Uh, she's provided us with these lovely Kigurumis, and not just us. She has given them to Tom and Eric as I well. I cannot wait to see this, <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I'm like, Tom, come on. It's pretty cool, the one you got, so I want to see it. And Eric's is still here with me, so when I see him next, he'll be able to get his. So I'm excited. <laughs> that is awesome. Well, and I mean, we had him. So if we're going to do Q&A. Exactly. We're going to wear the darn Kigurumis. So <laughs> I, I, it, I know it's hard to tell. I have a, a I am, I am a <gasps> narwhal. And look, it has do. mitten. Oh, so that's it's so very cool. toasty. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and this is, is. I, I'm quite impressed with my own thing here, i got to say. I feel like you've got lots going on. Me, I'm just, you know, I'm very obvious. I've got the, you know, who am I? I swear. I feel the chat. And hello to the chat. I see there's someone joining us from Denmark. Hello, a place I would actually love to go to. So one day. <laughs> but if anyone can guess, I think this is a pretty obvious one. One of my it's favorites. Pretty, come <laughs> on, everybody. The ch come on. Shh, maybe someone doesn't know. <laughs> Apologies. Jeez Louise. I'm sorry. But it's good to see you, Mandy. Uh, you. It's actually been a little bit odd because with the podcast and Tom traveling so much, I've been recording with Eric and then you know, you and I recorded a couple of episodes ago and now you're recording with Eric and um, and we just haven't been able to do this. So it's great to get to chat. Welcome everybody else. If you have questions for Mandy, for myself, about games, about being a narwhal and my life challenges, trying to thrive on land, feel free to <laughs> drop them in the chat and we will do our best to keep up. But uh, for now, Mandy, I wanted to ask you about Spy Club that I see behind you because I have not gotten to <gasps> play it. And have That's you gotten to play it or is that just something you just got? No, I haven't had a chance to play it. So technically that's not true. So Spy Club, this is by Renegade Games and Foxtrot Games. So the initial copy that I received was actually from Foxtrot. And that was a while ago. So on my other channel that I do videos to die for games, we did a little kind of overview. And it's supposed to be kind of uh, one of these, I don't want to say uh, legacy, you know, the games that kind of continue on. Mm -hmm. And it is geared towards kind of like a younger audience initially when we first played it, but it could be like a family type game and adults can play it as well. It, I'll be honest, it didn't capture me. The first time I played it, I said, it's, oh, interesting. it's not for me. And, okay. and I thought maybe it was just the type of game. I was like, maybe it's too simple, but I kind of just said, no, it's not for me. So Renegade has now taken it. And I didn't realize this, but Randy from Foxtrot, who is the designer said, I guess he went back and said, okay, I'm going to look at some things, tweak some things. And apparently there have been, some changes to the game, Dan King's like, Mandy, no, you need to play it. I think you will really like it with these changes. So don't know what they've changed fully yet. I'm okay, hoping to get it to cool. the table this weekend, but uh, yeah, definitely, you know, I like the whole detective spy kid aspect to it. So I'm hoping they kept that strong theme, but maybe just strengthen the, the gameplay a little bit. Yeah, I definitely love the art in it and the wide variety of characters and i think yes. that legacy kind of thing is super interesting or campaigny style yeah. play sounds super fun so i'm she's so cute look at her cute i know hair. i um, love the back so awesome. if anyone wants to take a look at that yeah it's a nice representation so oh that's cool well, i'm 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 looking forward to giving it a try uh <laughs> have i played star wall on steam from meeple overboard I honestly cannot tell if you're trolling me with a bad pun or if that's actually a game. So I will just say, no, I haven't played Star Wall on Steam. <laughs> and uh, let's see here. Jo Joseph is asking if we could pick one game and it was edible, which game would we eat? And it was edible. Like well, as in like edible, edible. Joseph, did you know that there is a chocolate edition of Catan? Oh, I have. I've heard this. And and so it's an actual chocolate 
like it's a box and it looks like a tan it says chocolate <laughs> on it you open it up and it's got little pieces that are chocolate but there's an actual game it's not quite the same as actual Catan in chocolate form it's a separate oh. little game and <laughs> i ate it before i even tried the game oh. so i can't tell you how good of a game it is but it was quite tasty to eat i, I feel like you'd want a game that has lots of like little components you know so that you could have different varieties of candied or chocolate items, you know? I'm trying to think mm -hmm. of a game that I have that has lots of bits. Lots of, like a Caverna. Ooh, Caverna. Ooh. I never finished that game. Oh my goodness, I'd want to eat everything. Ooh, look, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> some wheat. I'll eat that but off. We, can you see that we would we could end up in a really cool or awful situation, depending on how you view it, <laughs> of like, you know, the Birdie Bots, every flavor beans, the yes. jelly bellies that they did, but you have like earwax flavor jelly beans oh. in there and like really gross flavors <laughs> like if you do caverna are you gonna have like pig flavored candy bits uh, uh, like bacon flavored candy bits or like bread flavored candy bits okay i was just going for the more idea of like oh it's wheat so it's yellow and tastes like lemon i know that has nothing to do with what it looks like but i don't care it's just delicious do you like <laughs> do you like sugar based candies like lemon flavor candies and things like that better or do you like chocolate based candies better i'm more of a candy person chocolate okay. for me i can take it or leave it and if i have chocolate it would be uh more like white chocolate mm -hmm. but i'm more of a candy person like i love like okay i say jujubes i know they're jujubes but whatever uh, you know what i'm talking about but I, I like those kinds of like chewy type candies i even like the hard ones once in a while but i always want to do have you seen that commercial with the owl and the tootsie pop Okay. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he Mr. goes like, Owl, "How goes, many licks does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll center of a Tootsie Pop?" And then he goes, "A one, a two, three. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> and so, see, I feel like we would be. I mean, we already every. I mean, we already get along famously well. <laughs> but I feel like I'm even closer to you now because I don't really give a rat about candy like that. Oh, I want all the chocolate. So see, I can eat all the chocolate and all the dark chocolate while you get all my lemon drops and taffies and we're happy together. We can share. So happy together. <laughs> okay, Let's I see digress. here. Um, I thought I saw a question in here about, well, yeah. So solo mode, hi, solo mode is asking uh, on a scale of one to 10, one to welcome to, <laughs> how fantastic is Let's Make a Bus Route, which I think is... Right. Oh, I I'm haven't very played bad at this one. I see it. Okay, it's my I I can't honestly tell how well you can see things. Oh, it's really 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 good. It's it's very light. So in uh let's make a bus bus wout. In let's make a bus wout. You <laughs> actually have a shared board uh for a roll and write game. And it's very, very quick to play. And that's what surprised me when I actually started playing it. I'd seen it in previews, but how fast the game plays surprised me. What happens is that there's 12. I don't know why I held up four fingers for the number 12. <laughs> there's 12 cards, everybody. Maybe it's a times three you're three. trying to figure There we out. go. <laughs> um, there's 12 cards and six different colors. And you get two, two of each color, basically. And those dictate the routes that you can draw on this board. So maybe blue means you can draw three straight routes and maybe orange means you can draw a, a bent route. And these cards come up at random and you draw the routes accordingly and you're hitting these little marks as you go and you're collecting those on your personal board. You're marking what things you manage to collect like a tourist spot or a um, there's elderly people <laughs> that you can, I guess, pick up and help <laughs> along the way in your bus. We were saying, oh, I hit an elderly person and it sounded really awful because, yeah, so because you hit it with your line, not like with the bus, like oh, just drawing sorry. your line. Yeah, you're like, oh, I, I hit this and I hit this tourist spot and oh. I hit this. But then you're like, oh, I hit an elderly person. Oh, no, we can't say that. That sounds awful. Yeah, no, totally. So you pick them up in your bus. That's the whole point. You're picking these. You can pick up students. You can pick up commuters. You can pick up uh, elderly people. And everything scores a little bit differently. But then because it's a shared board, you're drawing these things, everybody gets a different colored pen. And then when you need to go somewhere that somebody else has already gone, you hit traffic and you have to mark off a little traffic mark. And whoever has the most traffic at the end of the game loses points. But you play in those 12 super fast rounds. It goes so quickly. You're going to knock out a five player game in under 30 minutes. Wow, and there's okay. no like there's barely any setup. 
So that's what really surprised me about it. In that respect, it's lighter than a game like Welcome To. But there are great decisions. Everybody's, the color matches a different movement for every player. So when blue is flipped over, it actually means something different to you than it does to me. Uh, and it just works. It's incredibly fun. It's it's very quick and easy to play and teach. It's thoughtful. You can never do everything you want to do, uh, but you can plan ahead and then you have to adapt as people get in your way. And then you yell at everybody else for getting in your way and causing traffic. And it's a lot of fun. It's super duper good. Let's make a bus route by Sashi and Sashi. They also did Coffee Roaster and um, Blend Coffee Lab. I have heard rumors that it's we have a shot of getting wider distribution. But I do know as fact that Board Game Geek picked up some of the extra stock from Game Market and are, they're going to list it in the BGG store, but they I think they only got like 25 copies and it's going to go quick. So Yeah. And then again, harder for us in Canada because it ends up being quite expensive. So we're crossing our fingers over here that, you know, it comes to an easier way for us to get it. Yeah, it sounds fun. I'm looking forward to trying it. Okay, we have a lot of questions now. <laughs> oh, sorry. I just, no, you, it's good. It's good. You start talking about rolling rights and I'm just gone. Well, there's there's gonna be more of that. But coming back to Meeple Overboard, it asks, is Spy Club kind of like a kid-friendly or time stories type game? From what I remember, because it, it was a while ago when I played this one, I would say has some bits that are a bit similar, but I don't know what they've changed since then. So it's really hard for me to give you like a final answer on that. However, I'll be playing it this weekend and then I'm going to hopefully talk about it in the podcast that we're on together, Suzanne and I, because the next podcast is going to be Eric and myself because Tom's away. Uh, we're talking top 10 cooperative games, I think. So um, I'll save it for the next one. Cool. Uh, uh, it looks like Spencer's asking, uh, Hi, Spencer, and all your beautiful family. Uh, <laughs> what tips do you have for when you are playing with someone who becomes emotional or upset about losing? Mm, do you oh, try yeah. to fix it, or is it not a big deal? What do you think, Mandy? It's happened to me before. And I think because I work in a field where I work in human resources, but I'm a facilitator, but I'm a teacher. It's just a fancy word for saying I'm a teacher. And there have been situations where I'm giving training or facilitation, and it's sensitive topics, and people get upset. I mean, obviously you don't want to make it a big deal because now it just escalates. So it's just one of those things you want to kind of empathize versus sympathize with someone because I think that can kind of make it get a little, you know, tense. You want to keep the focus to them, see how they're feeling and maybe why they're being like that a little bit. And even if it's one of those things where I feel like I'm the person who maybe will pull them aside and kind of say, hey, like, what's going on? Like, you know, why are, why are you upset? And maybe just get to the root of it. Sometimes people are just really competitive, you know? Um, and these are things where you kind of want to make ground rules ahead of time saying, hey, with the group, this is how it's played. But if I've had it happen, and I've actually just pulled someone aside and said, "Hey, like, tell me what's going on. Why, why are you upset?" That's the best way I can think of doing it. Otherwise, it becomes a thing, and then everybody—it almost feels like the person gets ganged up on a little bit, even though they're not—they're not behaving well. <laughs> I love that approach. I think that's such a sympathetic approach. Uh, I, I would just—I would assume you're talking about an adult, yes. because I think it's a little different with kids. Sure, absolutely. And I think we all have. Uh, people in game groups that we've encountered that tend towards that, right? That take it maybe a little bit extra seriously or have a little more struggle with that. Mm -hmm. Maybe also are there opportunities to play cooperative games with them or figure out types of games that may not be as stressful on them, um, that they feel a little less bad when they lose as well, figure out maybe some of that as well to kind of mitigate in advance that mm -hmm. might help as well but maybe i really love your approach i think that's an yeah. incredibly human way to to try to deal with it we've all had bad days you know what i mean and it, it's nice if people don't judge you based on that maybe just get to the root of the problem and let's be honest at the end of the day there are some people that's just just how they behave when they play a game and then you know for next time and how to handle it so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah let's see mad bonna hello hey. hi mad bonna uh <laughs> Question, what is your preferred method of driving forward the action in a game? Card, dice, or resources? You go first. because Oh, gosh. You go first. Oh, without a doubt, cards. Cards, yeah. number one, with resources being a close second and dice being a very, very distant third. Wow, very we're so distant different. Third. Really? Mm. I love my resources. Love my And where's Robert? I know you love your cubes, Robert, so I'm right there with you, but I love my resources. I like dice in a game. I don't care. I love dice. 
and cards for me are last. Which is so funny because I'm such a fan of roll and write games. Right. And for, in those types of games, I don't mind dice. But I have found in other types of games, like big, you know, battle games, and th- I'm just, I feel, maybe it's not true, but I feel like I'm a very unlucky roller. Oh, and I am, inevitably, for sure. I don't get what I want. And sometimes that's really frustrating. I feel like there's less predictability. With cards, you'll often be able to do some measure of calculation of the odds. Right. Uh, you know, oh, well, we've seen all the sevens, so now we know that we're going to get more twos and threes now or whatever. And I think I just prefer that. I don't mm-hmm. dislike dice, but it, I mean, come on, roll and write games, right? Yeah, exactly. But yeah, if I had to pick one in a vacuum, it would definitely be cards. Okay. No, and I, I and it's funny because it's hard because I totally love cards as well. But if that is what I had, I don't know. I like dice. I think I just like the I like the whole throwing the dice and wow, that was terrible. Ha, 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 Mandy, you're such a bad roller. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like a table conversation. I know I'm a terrible roller, but I just still have fun and it gets everyone involved. And we've got a little joke going on. And ah, I think I, I like the context around the dice more than anything. Okay, I think that's fair. Yeah. yeah that's cool. <sighs> All right. What's happening here? Oh, my goodness. I know, right? We have to. I, know. Ooh, I see a question from Brant Sanderson. Okay. Oh, have Brant. either of you played John Company? What is going on here? I feel like I'm so behind the times. I have not. Interesting. I, I wonder if you would like it. Mm. I have. So I've played John Company once. And okay. it is not the kind of game you can play once. And, mm. well, at least not for me. Uh, it's a game I felt like by the end of the game, I was just understanding how my decisions were impacting elements for myself and for others on um, on the board and within my own cards and things like that. Uh, it was interesting. I was playing with some of my favorite people to game with. It definitely didn't click with me. I'm not a huge fan of just the whole theme of it, to be honest with you. It's just doesn't do anything for me Mm -hmm. um the whole you know colonialism thing and and you know taking over asia and and whatever so uh played it very meaty very heavy lots going on i would play it again but i suspect that there are other heavy weighty games that i would prefer to invest my time in right right okay well maybe i'll if you're saying you don't think i would like it or well, you like these crunchy, heavier games, Mandy, so you might really, mm-hmm. really enjoy it. But I suspect you would stray to where I am that, okay. and I mean, the learn, just the way you are, right? <laughs> the teach and the learn would be brutal for you. Okay. It would, I, I suspect your first game would go a lot the way my first game went, where you mm-hmm. kind of go through the rules, and then, again, knowing you, you're going to, 20 minutes into the rules explanation, you're going to wish you were already playing. <laughs> and then an hour and a half into playing, you'll start to get a feel for the game. Okay. I feel like this should be a topic on one of our uh, victory points, like learning styles of a game. So for those who don't know, who've never played a game with me, due to the ADHD, I can only take in probably about 15 minutes of rules. And then I kind of stray a little bit. It's easier for me if you teach and then kind of show and then, okay, let's just play it and figure it out as we go. Not Mm -hmm. everyone's like that. I know some people that need to read the entire book out loud with everyone and that's how they learn. So I feel like this is something we should talk about at some point. Yeah, that'd be super fun. Yeah, very cool. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Eric is saying that if (laughs) if Gloomhaven was edible, you could sustain yourself for weeks. And that's (laughs) (laughs) That's that's true. true. Oh, wow. My goodness. Yeah, I don't know if that's a good thing, actually. (gasps) Oh, boy. It's hard to keep up with the chat. I love this chat. Y'all are tell you? so much fun. Our yeah. chats are fantastic. I, I'm not joking. And I, it's great because I know a lot of people in the chat, but we always have the best questions, just really positive. I thank you. I love the chat. It's fantastic. So David M's asking about family and spouse gaming and says that they love games, but they can't get their family and spouse into it. If a game's longer than a half an hour, they complain. Have we had any success getting our significant mm-hmm. others or family into the hobby? So I, do you mind if I jump in here, Suze? So I've always played games with my family, but like my mom, for example, she's really picky about the games that she plays. So it has to be a certain one. I try and find games where it has a theme of something that she likes. Like for example, she loves playing on her iPad, uh, is it Words with Friends or those types of games? Mm -hmm. So, or Candy Crush. So Mm -hmm. then I'm like, hmm, what's similar to those? So then I'm like, she likes Paperback and she likes Potion Explosion. 
huh? So there's a similar theme to what she's kind of already playing. So she'll like those. And then randomly, she liked uh, Lords of Vegas. I don't know how that happened, but we were, <laughs> <laughs> we were just playing it one time. Honest to goodness, I honestly think it's because she won. And then after that, she's like, ooh, I like this one. Let's play this again. I kid you not, I think it's because she won. But I try to find games that I know that are not like, and Lords of Vegas is not a short game. I think it's what, an hour or so? Like, it's, it's, it's 90 up minutes, yeah. Yeah, like it's up there. And mm -hmm. um, any of the other games are over that hour mark. I just, it's hard because you have to find something that kind of captures their interest, or maybe you need to find out something that can connect to what they're kind of already doing. And then you kind of have to progress. Maybe start off with those shorter ones. And then when you interject other ones, that are slightly longer, but it's interesting. They won't notice. I do it all the time with my colleagues. We started off with like 15 minute games. Now we're up to like full hour games. <laughs> you're very sneaky. I know. <laughs> and you know, sometimes you're just not going to be able to get your close people to enjoy your hobby on the same level that you, you are. And hopefully in that case, you, you can talk about that and say, Hey, you know, okay, tonight's my gaming night and tomorrow's your swim meet night. <laughs> or <laughs> no, no, but right? my I mean, best my best friends don't play games at all. Or your like book my club night, or whatever you yeah. know, whatever they want to do, and and try to find a balance that way, and uh, get your gaming fix, and then you know, separate from your partner or your family, so that you also don't like build up any kind of emotional resentment that you know you have this thing that you want to enjoy, but your family won't enjoy it with you, and then you right. don't um, get to enjoy it, and that would be a bummer too. You wouldn't want you, you would never want games to lead to bad feelings. Absolutely. It's supposed to be yeah. happy, fun, good. Exactly. Yeah. I have to say, I was shaking my head and I can feel this thing wobble. And it's, <laughs> Is it throwing you off a little I bit? I don't know. It's I don't, it's kind of like a little head massage. I have a actually. unicorn one. I'll wear, well, you know, and I think we need to plan this. So for all the people who know us in the chat, I swear, we need to have something where we can just have other people be in the chat, like watch and like show us your a best. A onesie party? Yeah. onesie <laughs> party. Show us your best kickaroos. I am dead serious because I have I'm like in. four of these. So we're going to do it. We're going to set a date and I don't care who you are you have one, you're going to wear it. Okay. We're going to plan this. I like this. Okay. <laughs> uh, David's asking if uh, we have, or I have any suggestions for a gateway level roll and write game that has a fun or cutesy theme. Mm. Yeah. I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I would say the ones that come to mind and, and barring availability, because that's always the challenge. There's actually far more uh, roll and write games available in the European market than there are just in the US or North American market, which is a shame. Mm. The first one that comes to mind is Zularetto Warfelspiel. Oh. So, so if you like, if you like Zula, I mean, Zularetto is a fabulous game, but there is a roll and write version of Zularetto. And actually, just six months ago, mm. they released three new sheet sets for it. Oh. Okay. So three expansions, essentially, because they have just three new pads of paper that you can add to, you know, the game that you already have. Right. It's lovely. It is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful roll and write game. And it has that Zularetto theme. So the dice have little animals on them and things like that. So it's very cute. And it's an it's a really nice roll and write game. Harvest Dice is available mm. broadly. And the, I also really like Harvest Ace and that one you get to draw your little vegetables, which is a lot of fun and it's very cute. Um, the dice drafting is maybe considered a little unusual. I don't know if you consider that entry level. I think it's a very simple. Yes, I would right say though. so. I agree so with you. Harvest Dice and Zularetto, the dice game, are the two that pop to mind for me for that kind of fun themed entry level roll and write. And I have to say Zularetto, I played it recently because you had suggested we were talking about it on our uh, top 10 roll and writes on uh, the podcast so I was like oh I don't have this one I'm gonna go check it out and I went on uh, Amazon to DE so I've, I'm hoping to order it. I just need a few more things to add to my order but I played it at a comic-con recently and it was fun I really liked oh, it God, the, I'm so glad yeah, and the people I played with really liked it so thank you for that suggestion it was quite good cool that's so cool yeah. all right I'll let you do the questions you're good at finding them I'm all over the place no. <laughs> well, now you say that now I'm like oh my gosh oh Brad say that they learn by getting the rules wrong. Well, that's for John Company. Oh, oh my goodness. That listen, was for me. it happens to me all the time. And can I tell you, you will never forget the game after that because I'm sure you'll either A, have someone tell you, you did this wrong, or you'll play it and something totally doesn't make sense. You're like, oh, wow, totally did that wrong. But then you remember after that. So you know what? I think it's a great way to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Meeple Overboard is asking, when you play legacy games, are you bingers? Schedule once a week, Fortnite players, Fortnite, or sporadic players. Well, Mandy, if you don't mind, I'm going to answer this Please, real fast. yes. I haven't played a legacy game. <laughs> and it's it's primarily because 
benefits of the gameplay schedule. And if I were to play one, and Inca and Marcus Brand have one coming out, and they are one of my favorite design pairs out there right now, I'm, I think that's going to be the one I have to dive into. Mm-hmm. Um, I've thought about binging Charterstone in a weekend and trying to get a few people over and just two days, lots of pizza and, you know, carrot sticks and going, going to town on it. But um, I haven't had that chance yet. How about you, Mandy? So I did play Charterstone. This is actually the first legacy game that I played. And people were like, what? Really? Why? It, it's time. I, I, I mean, I have a full-time job. And then doing this is kind of, it's a job in itself as well, right? So between that and trying to get games played to talk about, uh, we got together to play Charterstone. It started off as like a once, like whenever we could do it sort of thing, because I have a problem with commitment, okay? Because I have so many things happening. It's just, I can't commit to a time all the time. And then we found out that my friends are moving to Vancouver and we literally had to just like kill five games in like a day. So one of our friends literally took the day off work. I happened to be off work. And then they, the other two took some time off and we literally just played the last like five games in one day. <laughs> and you enjoyed it though. I liked it. I did horribly and I came in last, but uh, I really enjoyed it. Okay, Jeff, Jeff, uh, who edits our episodes of the podcast is a wonderful person is asking if us to break a tie. If we could only pick one type of pie, would we pick apple, cherry, French silk, or key lime? And that okay. is a ridiculous question. He asked me this when I was on Renegade's uh, stream. Oh. So I, okay, I'm curious to see what you say. I refuse to answer. There are so many factors that go into judging pies. And so, I mean, come on. Okay, come on. You can pick Season there's out. one. Mood, quality. Come okay, well, on. there's one there that's absolutely gross. So, which one? French silk. Are you kidding me? French silk Whoa. pie is delicious. You don't like chocolate, though. I'm not a chocolate person. Okay. So for me, that one like doesn't. But every all the other ones there are fantastic. But I'm trying well, very hard not to judge you. And <laughs> and you know that Tom. Not that Tom's going to watch this, but I will remind him, and you have to help me remind him. <laughs> That he has promised real key lime pies at Dice Tower Con for us. Oh, he has to convince me because I'm not a I, key lime pie is one of those things. I like it. It's not a love, but I think it's because I have not found the key lime pie of my dreams. So if he can provide this, <laughs> I will that be the way of it sometimes. <laughs> I know. I'll be so happy. So I'm looking forward to this. Do not disappoint, Tom. If you're. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Uh, Joseph's asking, uh, what are we looking forward to at Origins? I haven't even had a chance to go through my listings and see what's coming up. Um, have you had a chance? This is something I was planning to do this weekend. Oh, I was actually. just going to say the food. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people are going to start to wonder about our health at this point. Eh, you know, whatever. No, um, uh, similarly, it's been very, very busy. And Origins isn't necessarily a huge release convention. So... It takes a little more work to know what's coming out there because not as many groups are doing lists of of what's coming out. I will say, I think Junk Orbit, which... Yes, it's in the back. Have you played it? Yes. Oh, I played it. I played both modes. Did you play both modes? It's so good. I like it. Did you like it? Okay, well, we'll talk about it on the podcast. Okay, the podcast, yeah. But for those of you who don't listen to the podcast, which is totally fine... um, Mandy, what do you think of Junk Orbit? <laughs> I liked it a lot. I really, really liked it. I liked the two modes. The second, I do think they need some arrows to happen on the, the boards because after a while you get confused. But I really enjoyed it. it. It's simple in nature, but you really have to take control of the things that you're delivering. I don't know. That kind of sounds weird if you don't know the game, mm-hmm. but I, I enjoyed it. And I like the art. I thought the little cat with the bubble on his head was really cute. <laughs> the one of a couple of people in my group they're they're they love kitties and okay. they noticed that like the kitty's little he- helmet has a little crack in it they're like oh, oh no oh, well, kitty's well, didn't see that at all. Yeah. uh I, I was so all of us who played were just impressed with junk orbit it exceeded our expectations exactly right mandy it's it's mechanically very very simple and straightforward but as you start to play you realize how this little mechanism of throwing something that way and then right. having to travel the other way and where you land, what you pick up, what you can deliver, trying to maximize what you pick. There's there's some nice depth here. It still plays very simply and yeah, it's it's yeah. a good one. I was pleasantly surprised with. So 
I've Renegade kindly provides a review copy for us. So we already have it. But if I didn't have it, that would actually be big on my origins, like excitement list, because it, it's, it surprised me. I really like no, it. It looks really good. And, um, the people, I, my friends that were like, oh, what about the box uh, that comes in? Because it's a cylindrical. Oh. And I said, you know what? I actually think it's great because you have a couple ways you can store it. Actually, storing cylindrical boxes are actually more efficient than square and uh, space, you know, space efficient. And then you can put them on top. Anyway, I have no issues with it, but I thought that might be a big concern for some people. Um, I don't think it's going to be an issue. My, uh, yeah, a couple. That was the one complaint yeah. some people in my group had. They really disliked the box shape. Yes. Um, I'm more ambivalent on it. I don't love it. I don't hate it. I'm for me, it works. I mean, I like to have a bit of uh, um, change and diversity in my shelving and how it looks, the presentation. So for me, I'm like, it's great. It adds a little pizzazz. And guess what? I'm going to go, ooh, that game. Let's play that one because it stands out. It's different. So for me, it's doing its job. Uh, there was another one they had, and I don't know if it's Origins is coming out or, or is it Gen Con, the um, Tea Dragon Oh, um, Dragon Tea Society. Sorry, Dragon Tea. I keep getting that backwards. Dragon Tea Society. And uh, I was talking to Scott and Sarah on the Renegade uh, stream, and they are going to have a special box at cons. It's going to be in a white, the white Ooh. box. Oh, it's so pretty. So I'm hoping that we get a copy so I can show all of you. And I think it's fantastic. Anyway, we I think we talked about that on the last podcast, and uh, I I really like you. All right. I'll check it out. Uh, and, and so – Sorry that we don't have more more information for you, Joseph. If, if for everybody in the chat, what are you looking forward to at Origins? Yeah. Tell us what we should be looking out to, since we are completely failing, <laughs> failing you as as board game podcasters. What should we be looking? Help us, help us, help us, help you. Um, so I apologies if I mispronounce this name, but Malu or Malu, a uh, Holly saying that. Love you guys. So oh, thank you. Thank That's very you. kind of you. Uh, what's our favorite lunchtime game? We, they just started playing at work. Mandy, you know a little <laughs> bit about lunchtime games, don't you? It's lunchtime. I sure do. <laughs> I'm trying to think right now because we tr we switch it up often. Uh, you know which one actually went over really well? And I, I thank my friend Chris, my coworker Chris, for bringing this one. It was Medici the card game. Went over really well with our Good group. One. And uh, Oh, it was, yeah, fantastic. And also, believe it or not, Fabled Fruit by uh, oh. Stronghold Games. So we've actually been doing it as a group, running through each one, right? Because it's like the story. So you do one and then you pick up where you left off. My group has been loving it because it's really straightforward. It's really cute artwork. You know, the different spaces you can move to is are interesting and it was easy to teach. So that one has been doing fantastically well at my work. So I think uh, Fabled Fruit's doing well. Medici, the card game. And uh, Quicks. Quicks went over fantastically well uh, at work. They love it. So those are those are just some. I, mean, I can give you a long list, but those are kind of the top three right now that are doing really well with my colleagues. What about you? Uh, well, excellent suggestions. Uh, of course, I'm going to say Roll and Write games are wonderful, wonderful lunchtime games. They're often compact and portable and play a wide variety of player counts really well. Quix is a great one. So I'll just say, in general, Roll and Write games. Um, and then I would typically go, especially for people who may not have as much experience with a wide variety of games, I really love little compact card games that play a wide variety of player counts very well. So I'm thinking of games like No Thanks or Six Nymphed. Coloretto. Right. I they're they're easy to keep on hand. They're really quick to set up. They play two to six players, some of them that you know just play really, really well. Um, and they tend to be crowd pleasers. They tend to be games people pick up on really quickly. And so those would be some of my lunchtime suggestions. Yeah, no, some good ones. And don't get me wrong, there are so many that I can list off. Actually, behind me, we played uh, this one not too long ago. Micropolis. <laughs> So I did talk a little bit about this at the podcast when we were at Simon, but um, we also played uh, King Domino at lunch, and it would say it's about this level. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it has I found just a little bit more. I um, I was taught this game actually by Eric Lang. Actually, he's the one who taught this to me, and he's like, I really enjoyed it. I tried it. I also really enjoyed it, and I like it because you've got a bit of set collection. You're trying to take tiles to build longest routes, have the most workers, you know, things like that. So it's very straightforward. A lot of um, very basic elements that you'll see in a lot of game, um, and that went over very well. And it was very easy to explain. So that's another one, Micropolis. And that's, uh, who distributes that one? That's Matt Tego. Cool. Uh, let's see here. Well, uh, Ot Otter, or Otter uh, is very, very kind and saying, please wear these hoodies at Essen. <laughs> Yay, I'll, we have a few, so we'll try. <laughs> we will see what we can do about that. I, I mean, the Dice Tower live show in onesies would probably not happen, 
but it would be epic. Oh my gosh, can we make this happen? <laughs> yes. You just need to get Sam and Z on board. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, can you picture Sam? Oh my I would pay, I would start a cash pool to see Sam <laughs> in a onesie. <laughs> I love it. I, yeah, I, I'm curious to see if that would ever happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brant is back and asking and and uh, asking about top three Uve games. Oh, oh, oh you oh, are that's evil! Like, oh, can't, that's so hard. That's like asking to pick up favorite pie. It's almost I, impossible. Yes, and Uve is like one of my favorite. Okay, so let's see. Right now, oh, I can think, and not in any particular order because a few people judge me. But Glass Road, oh, so good. Uh, Caverna. Well, Caverna is my number one. I don't even know why I said that. Glass Road, Caverna. Oh, gosh. Ooh. Oh. I have a few in my mind right now, but I just. Well, okay. my number one is Fields of Arla. I've not played it. I've oh, not played come it. Come on, Mandy. Get it together. Well, it's two player only, and that can be rough. See, and okay, I found my third patchwork. Now, the reason why I pitch Patchwork, and that has more of a personal kind of touch for me, is because it's a game I play with my mom, and she loves Aww. it. So for me, that definitely has to be in my top three. So Glass Road, Caverna, and Patchwork. And I would say uh, Patchwork is definitely my number two. I, yeah. I just adore it. I think it's so clever. Fields of Arla, Patchwork, and then maybe Glass Road or, I don't know, I think Bonanza the Duel. I know people... <laughs> It's incredibly clever. It made a two-player negotiation game right. work. How brilliant is that? It's it's so clever. And one of my favorite two-player games right now. So, uh, you know, I also really, really like Aura at Labora. Again, um, haven't played it. Yeah, it's a good one. It's Those a good one. the two one. that have been on my list. I don't own them. So there you go. Shout out to anyone going to Origins and wants to teach me those two games. <laughs> I'm willing to play. <laughs> oh, so Meeple's asking, Meeple Overboard's asking about Kokoro using cards instead of dice. So does Welcome To uh, mm -hmm. and Avenue that uses cards. Uh, Let's Make a Bus Route uses cards. My stance on card-driven roll and write games is you could call them something else. You could call them right. draw and draw. There was some discussion about calling these types of games randomize and write. Uh, the fact is, is that a while ago they were called pen and paper games or pencil and paper games. Right. I remember that. And somehow roll and write took off a, while, a couple of years ago. And I'm a big fan in this case of simple, common terminology. Right. When you start dividing the genre, I mean, we're already in a niche hobby. And then you start dividing the, the, the sub niches that we create Euro, Amerithrash, Cube Pushers, Troops on a Map, whatever. Um, when you start dividing them further, it 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 I think it adds complexity to sharing the experience and spreading the hobby that doesn't need to be there. So I like simple common terminology. So I call card-driven roll and rights card-driven roll and rights, or just call them roll and rights. And people don't seem to throw up too much of a fuss about, about that. That's just my personal opinion on it. Yeah. Yeah. I think you said it all. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see here. Coconut cream pie. That's all I saw. My eyes oh, just see. Coconut Not cream. Me. Yeah. That's now, all who, said, no. pie. who said that? Coconut cream pie? Yes. Yes. <laughs> all the yes. Well, Mandy, do you think that the there's the avalanche of legacy games is over? It seems like fewer such games are coming out this year. You know... And I always liken this. People always will hear me talk about liking it to fashion or because I used to work in fashion and makeup and these sorts of things. There's always that wave where it's like, yeah, it's great. It's awesome. And everyone wants to do them and it's cool. And then it'll kind of taper off. They'll still be there, but it won't be as popular. And I think we're kind of coming into that now, but I think it's still kind of be, it's going to still kind of hang around and just maybe evolve a little bit differently and then potentially turn into another trend or something else. But I definitely think it's sticking around I just don't think it may be as hyped as it was before. What do you think? I think it, I, I mean, it's, a, it's, I think with the, uh, oh, now, of course, I'm going to say, I'm going to say it wrong, but the special prize, I'm just going to say it in English and then <laughs> beg for forgiveness, but the Is special it? prize uh, for the, for the spiel, right, oh, that okay. they awarded to Matt Leacock and Rob Davio, I think says a lot about legacy games and the introduction of this. Mm -hmm approach or niche to the hobby. I don't think it's going anywhere. I think that the 
effort and work in developing a legacy game of quality is so intense. Um, I get to work a little bit with Rob Davio through Restoration Games because I consult with them. Mm -hmm. And I get to hear a few stories on the side about some of the development efforts. Um, you know, Betrayal, House of the Hill, Legacy is being developed and is going to come out soon, which sounds pretty cool to me. It, it's such an intensive process. And I think it's a unique development process that not all game designers are really set up for or geared towards or would even enjoy. Mm -hmm. Which I think then inherently limits, you know, the pool of people who are going to be making these games, let right. alone making them well. You know, so we had a little rush. We saw some attempts, right? I know right. of at least two legacy game attempts that have never come to market um, uh, by fairly well-known groups um, because of some of that. So it may have felt like there was a lot. I don't think it was as many as you may feel like. And I think they're going to still come out, but they take so much time and so much work to develop. I think you can only get so many of them out in, in a given year. I think it's just that it was there were probably not as many as we think, but they were just really talked about. So it kind of seemed like For sure. there were a lot. And yeah, and it's just it's one of those things on every like we were just talking about. These are games that we can't generally play because we're really busy, right? So it is mark generally there is a marketable group that it appeals to. So I definitely think it's something that they're gonna maintain, but it'll transform potentially to something that's a bit more accessible to like people like us, for example, who are really busy. So can I just say this, Mandy, real quickly? Kabuki Kid joined the chat. Kabuki Yay! Kid, the prolific Hi. Kabuki Kid. Hi, Kabuki Kid. And Kabuki Kid says that my onesie reminds them of Dagath, the monster from Conan the Destroyer. And I have to say, that is about the nicest thing anybody has ever said to me. So Hi, thank guys. you. That's amazing. <laughs> See, mine's just evil to begin with, but <laughs> yours is evil in disguise. <laughs> Nazca Games is here. Is that Emerson? Emerson. Oh, my goodness. Hi, Emerson, if you're still here, because I don't know how long ago that was. Uh, <laughs> I know, and it's, you know, so Emerson Matsuchi, who is responsible for, you know, Century Spice Road, which is super, super popular. <gasps> is we, Eastern Wonders coming out at Origins? Oh, my gosh. Can you please put this in the chat? If you're still there, uh, it looks so good. So I want to know. Yeah, we're going to hope to get a response to that. And I hope, how's the, um, how's the French I, going? Because when I also we, want to know about we, Reef. When's Reef coming out from Plan B Games? Oh, that's right. Is okay, that coming out Origins? Oh. So now that we have this Origin talk, it's so good. And Emerson, I hope the the French is going well because every time we meet, we uh, you know parle français un petit peu at the con. So I hope we can have a little chat again in French when we oh, see each other. You, you and your French. <laughs> okay, um, Otter is asking if we are fans of the Time Stories series, and if yes, what are some of our favorite modules? I have only played the original. And I'm going to be honest with you, I was a little, oh, so I was playing with a group. I love it. Wait, them to did death. you just say you've only played the original? Yeah, the base. Mm -hmm. Like, I haven't played any of the expansions. I don't own it. So it was part of our library with our game group. So I played at the, the library version. And I played with a group that was, uh, they're, they're great. But they're so hard-headed. I'm like, don't do this. Don't do this. It's the wrong thing. And... It, oh, they didn't listen to me, and and that was like my last experience with it. So it was a lot of that tug of war kind of thing. I would love to play it again, uh, but again, I have to try and get my hands on the copy because I don't own it. That that's time stories. Oh, is one of my favorite game experiences. I just love it. I did a top fifty games list a while back mm -hmm. and time stories actually made it uh, into my top 10. I think I hey. love it. Uh, I, I just have had such positive gaming experiences and each module plays out and feels different to me. Um, clearly from a narrative point of view, but you know, sometimes the, 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 the mechanical thread that goes through it works for me. I enjoy it fine. And then, you know, the, the customization by module I've, I've overall enjoyed. Certainly I've enjoyed mm -hmm. some more than others. Um, I think the original, I loved it. I loved the original. And I remember um, there was a red herring we followed and we got so upset about it and we're just kicking ourselves. I will think, I do say, I think there's some thematic and art challenges in okay. the original uh, that have been openly criticized by others that I concur with, but right. I still enjoyed that experience. Um, I am on the expedition one and we have not finished uh if we have not finished it. We had to pause it after two runs because we, right. we didn't win. <laughs> um, 
Oh, but it's really good. I really am liking it. So I'm really excited to finish that one. But I love Time Stories. Uh, I love each module for what it offers. And mm -hmm. I think it's a great concept. And I, I'm looking forward to more and more of it. So I think my colleagues in the chat, uh, Chris, so my my the two people that I play with, Tracy and Stefan, who used to be with me on a Board Game Breakfast with our lunchtime segment that we used to do, are leaving. So they're moving to Vancouver, and they are great. They were my go-to for games. I just bring them over. Hey, I haven't played this yet. Let's go through it. They were amazing. So Chris, my coworker, has offered to take that place for me. So shout out to Chris. If you have time stories, I think we need to play it because or continue because it sounds so good and everyone's talking about it. So got to give it a try. And Scott Gaeta. <laughs> Scott, oh, yeah, is he asking is, about songs? Scott is asking you if you're going to sing. He missed it. I Did, did I not sing? Oh, was that on air? No, maybe it was. I don't know. Well, would you like, like to sing now? No. It had to, be, <laughs> it had to be moved. I have to be in the moment. So it has to be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and I think when you least expect it. And, oh, wait. This was for Scott. Scott. Oh, look here. You're such a goofball. <laughs> Those look very pretty. Look at him, he's so demanding. Oh, Emerson's saying that there's going to be a limited number of Reef Origins. Yes. Oh. Oh, okay. oh I, want, I guess I, want, I know what we, booth I'm rushing. Yeah, we need to go there first. <laughs> we need to go there first. Uh, and Chris is saying, you know, there are homebrew PNPs for Time Stories on BGG. And I have not oh. done any of the homebrews, mainly because I'm lazy. Um, well, I'm kind of right there with you. It's, for you me, know, it's time. It's time. Effort is just, ugh. but I know at least. Was it Estrella Drive? One of the, you know, they they put out a developer's kit for Time Stories. And at least one of the fan-made scenarios made it and got developed into a produced scenario. And I think that's incredibly cool. Okay. I didn't. Yeah. So maybe I'll look into it. It's just for me, it's time. So you know what? This is where, like, when my brother comes to visit, I'm like, here, do you want to do this for me? <laughs> and I'll get him to do it. Yeah, so note to self. Oh, and Emerson, Emerson said uh, Spectre Ops expansion will also be at Origins. Oh, that's awesome. I have not, I really enjoyed my play with that. And I would never want to play that against Emerson because I would probably, oh my goodness. <laughs> he would take over the game. Like, I feel like he would be the one to just like drive it home. Like, I would not, I don't know. He's so good. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 uh, Nope, I would not want to challenge uh, him at all. <laughs> There's like I, people, people. I'm a narwhal. I'm not. I'm not a weird monster. I am a wonderful unicorn of this unicorn of the sea. <laughs> yeah. Is okay. Obvious. I love how mine is. So people just know I'm like the mischievous Cheshire cat in Alice in Wonderland. That is it. Yours has so much, so much speculation. It's wonderful. That's just not cool. Bill Cook is mentioning all creatures big and small. Now, have you played that one, that Uve title? No. You haven't played Ag Agricola, all creatures big and small? I Again, haven't. Okay, I'm going to say this. Fire. Oh, okay. And please, no one judge me. I have not played Agricola. So I didn't even try it because so many people were like, oh, no, Agricola, it's like too tight on resources. It's not enjoyable. Just go straight to Caverna. So I just went straight to Caverna, which I love. And then I kind of was like, do I really need to play Agricola? question mark so but what are your thoughts on that one because i have not played it agricola yeah uh, no uh all creatures big and oh small. all creatures great and small love great it and small, sorry. i love i love all i really like all three of the two-player reductions apparently air quotes are three fingers now i, <laughs> what I what think counting is not my skill set today um the claws soon. i was thinking three you know and and then i put up six fingers just to make it even better <laughs> um i all creatures great and small lahav and the kv cave all three of those games stand on their own as really enjoyable two-player experiences so all creatures big and small mandy i think you would like it i wish it wasn't i don't want to carry a bunch of games to origins but because i think we'll be too busy origins to play a ton of games um but you and i would have I wonder if it's on like Tabletopia or. Oh yeah. I didn't think about that actually. Or, you know what? All Creatures Great and Small has a wonderful digitized app. Duh. <gasps> and you know what, Mandy? We should stream it. We should play oh. All Creatures Big and Small on the app against each other and live stream it. And then people can make fun of us. Okay. So if anyone's well, interested fun of you, in because the my lives... choice will be genius. <laughs> yeah. Well, we all know this. Come on now. We know how you <laughs> like to stab me in the back, but I know it's maybe not that type of game. No. But even you know how you are. I went there. Mm. Streams <laughs> over, people. We're done. 
<laughs> so now I'm curious if people are actually interested in seeing us potentially streaming games or even just streaming this one, come cheer me on because apparently I am awful. <laughs> No, let it, us, it, it'd be great. We could do this. This is it, this would be so much fun. Well, people will let us know. People will let us know. And then if people are like, no, terrible idea. Well, fine. We'll just keep that play to ourselves. But if you're like, yeah, we want to see you. We want to come. We want to make fun of you. We want to cheer you on. But whatever. It's so much enterta- more entertaining to have you lose in public. <laughs> what is going on here? Nothing. <laughs> nothing. You look so cute today, Mandy. As Love you. you. <laughs> <laughs> I see the glint in your eye. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, see, this is not this is not gonna go well. <laughs> I think it's the narwhal costume that's that's really I'm bringing so it up. Yes, me. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Okay, what else do we have in this chat? I see some. These are some great questions. I'm having fun with these. And everybody's loving seeing Scott and and yes. Emerson oh yeah, exactly. I love it. <laughs> oh look, and uh, oh, so I have some offers. Emerson also said likes Agricola. Oh, you like Agricola as much as Caverna. Okay. And teach it to me. No, it's okay. Not in French because I don't always know all the French terminology. So it's perfect. But I mean, I feel I should play it at least to make the comparison. So I I will take you up on that for sure. That's awesome. (laughs) That's very, very cool. Um, And, you know, Mandy, I don't know if you ever, it's hard to keep up on all the online channels, but in the last episode of the podcast, not the last one, the one before. So the one that we recorded live at uh Simon Expo, right? We had a really fun discussion about uh production quality or the term ah. overproduced, right? In board games. And it was really interesting. I thought there was some interesting online chat about that afterwards. And it's funny because I, I just noticed the reason why it popped to mind is I just saw Council of Four behind you. And I actually think mm. I have it behind me as you well. Do. I don't know, somewhere. And um a couple you know somebody said, well I'm surprised you didn't talk about overproduction about Council of Four when you were literally at Simon Expo. No, it's right. sideways, baby. There we that's go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. And um, I thought that that was fair. And I realized, though, I hadn't talked to you about it, Mandy. We didn't talk about, we talked about Council of Four in general from a gameplay point of view, but we didn't talk, it from, talk about it from a, a, a production investment point of view. And I know I have my opinion, but do you have any thoughts on that in terms of like specifically Council of Four? Maybe you should start because I know this is a game that you know well, like I've been playing it and stuff, but I think you have a bit more insight than I do. So maybe you should start this because I know that question did come up. And I mean, I was only thinking about certain aspects, but it was, it's a smart inquiry, I guess. So mm-hmm. uh, I think Council of Four absolutely does not need the production quality that it has to play it and enjoy the game. But I would not apply the term overproduced to it. Now, for people who've listened to the podcast, they know that I am, I stray towards the, what does overproduced really mean anyway, (laughs) side of the spectrum here. But the production doesn't distract from the gameplay. In many ways, it enhances it. The minis are great on the board, and they make you see where you are well on the board. Um, they're they're stable and sturdy on the board as you're moving the council. You have these big mini figures, whereas in the uh, Cranio edition, it's little meeples in this cute little balcony. Um, and that worked very well as well. But uh, the miniatures are actually more stable. And, I mean, certainly as you're putting this thing on the table, it's impressive. It looks cool. And it adds, I don't know, a, a, a certain little extra something. And I think it only, it's it's a $50 or $60 price point on it. It's not an $80 game or a $100 game. Quite frankly, a lot of Euro style games are in that price range as well. So to say that you're having a really nice Euro style game experience with really high quality miniature plastic pieces for a price that you would have that whether you had the plot like i think it's i think it's fine personally oh but- I, I i think i posted this anybody who follows me on twitter uh i played it again last night actually um uh, it's council of four with uh, my colleague chris and my friend tracy and it, it's literally one of those games i really enjoyed it i will tell you right now the miniatures are completely unnecessary you don't need them 
but I enjoy seeing them in the game. It adds a bit of color to the game. I like having them. Like, is that so wrong that I like that? Granted, yes. No, but some people feel like, oh, I don't need all that and it's spending the extra money. But you're right. In Canada, I looked it up. I think it's like $52 Canadian, which is unheard of. I've bought games who have no miniatures and they are pure cardboard um, and they're $70, $75. So, I mean, how much of that, you know, actually swayed the cost of the game? So, no, it's still a great game. And actually, I had questionable choices about why there were miniatures for some things and then not upgraded pieces sure, for others. Sure. So that was more where I kind of was, oh, okay. And it could have been a cost thing for sure. But again, not necessary, but I don't care. I liked it in the game. I like what it brought to the game. Didn't affect the gameplay. Made it look good. I tell people I would be considered overproduced. Seriously, and I don't mean that. In, it's not a negative thing. Listen, oh I spent. Oh my god, that's hilarious! But listen, <laughs> listen, listen. I, go with me on this, okay? Oh, I'm so, with you, sister. I'm right there in the passenger seat with you right now. I'm going to say, I am the same person whether um, I color my hair, my hair is dark, or, you know, if I wear normal glasses, or if I don't wear makeup, or, you know, if I'm just wearing black suit all the time. I choose to be wearing this pink Cheshire Cat Kigurumi. I choose to color my hair blue. I choose to wear these flashy glasses and to have this crazy personality. Does it affect, does it affect how I am as a person? I'm still the same person, regardless of how I'm dressed like this or not, or the other way. It doesn't matter. I do find sometimes people will judge based on that, and it's the same with games, right? Mm. So, and I put a lot of money into looking this way, but that's my choice. Mm. Interesting. And I think that that was something, and I I am so enamored <laughs> with this, I can't even, like, I'm just <laughs> amused and enchanted. Um, I'm very curious to see the comments well, on that. Well, because I'm lucky though. enough to, to know you in many forms and <laughs> you're delightful in all your many forms. Um, somebody did bring up ex like price accessibility though. And right. does it drive up the price? And I will definitely agree that when component quality drives up the price of the game to a point where it really makes it unaffordable, that's a shame. And I totally agree with that. Oh, hundred percent. to your point about the CMON price the, of the council of four in Canada relative to the, I mean, I think I paid, closer to like 70 us dollars to get my cranio edition oh, because so it wasn't produced in the u.s so i think i paid 50 bucks or 60 bucks for it anyway and then shipping from europe oh, yeah. to get it right. you know and then you you have this simon edition with all that bells and whistles for a comparable price so i don't think in that specific instance it right. negatively impact impacted the price accessibility of the game so I see uh, uh, Otter. Uh, I'm not high maintenance. I'm overproduced. I like it. I'm going to make a shirt that says that. I oh my love goodness. it. Good line. And also, um, is it DG um, talks about potentially um, publishers selling miniatures as part of an expansion pack? And I actually like, I, but I like this concept where, like, for example, I choose to do this. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not forcing anyone to pay for me to look like this, much like games. Right. Could you not have it where? this is the game, but then give the people the choice, like, nah, I want that jazzed up game and then go and, you know, buy those pieces separately. I can understand that. And I think that's actually a really cool concept. I just don't know how that would work cost wise. Yeah. Conceptually it's, it's lovely and arguably the ideal. The reality is, is the way that uh, print run costs work. It, I just don't think it's feasible when you uh, start to talk about different SKUs and things like that. A separate minis pack would be considered a different SKU. Your factories are going to demand new minimums. So let's mm -hmm. say you have a minimum print run of a thousand of a game, but then you want to offer a lower, like uh, a simplified version of the game. Mm -hmm. And then you want to offer a minis pack. Well, now you have to have a thousand base run of the game and a thousand of the minis pack. Well, not everybody's going to buy the minis pack that buys the game, right? Because right. they don't want them and don't care. But so then it really does create, and that's just a very obviously simplified sure. example. It, it, sure. It really, for the vast majority of games and publishers, it is just not feasible to offer that kind of pick and choose flexibility right. for the same board game. I wish it was otherwise. It would be really cool. But um, the production realities, I think, is prohibitive. And that's what I figured. It would be just very expensive. So... So, Mandy, we're running up on an hour here. I know we got a late start. Yes, I think we have like a couple of minutes. So I don't know if there's any last minute things we want to point out. Um, wow. 
chat's just going crazy. And um, and seriously, scroll, though, scroll, Otter, scroll. I just wanted to say to Otter, though, like I'm legitimately making that shirt. So with your permission, I would <laughs> like to use that because I am going to make Suzanne and I shirts. So hopefully we'll have them by S. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. Oh, yeah. We have to do. Yeah. yeah. I, well, if, if, I ha if I get one of these, I want it to have a purple narwhal on it. Okay. <laughs> we'll try and make this happen. I'm not. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> oh, and then the Brothers Murph. Are they in just, now? They just jumped in. Oh, guys. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine them and Kigurumi's on? <laughs> <gasps> oh, idea. Look at Mike. <laughs> they need, they need, they need Kigurumi's. Bing bong. I, <laughs> I am not dabbing. No matter what, it's not happening. I'm not dabbing on this feed. Not even for the Brothers Murph, who I adore. Who I adore. I totally oh, did God, that maybe. wrong, but I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Okay, I'm sorry. I'm getting distracted. Okay. Well, and we have pizza plans and new things to look at origins. Okay. Maybe we should finish off by telling people the cons because people keep asking what cons we're going to. And um, maybe we want to talk a little bit. Like, I know we're the going to origin. episode of the podcast, right? We want to clarify that. Yeah. So please, maybe, yeah, let you do that. Let's clarify. <laughs> Did okay, so the podcast, I, I made a boo-boo. I, I made a boo-boo on the podcast. And I said episode 559 was going to be the live show at Origins. And I'm wrong. It's episode 560. So I apologize. Uh, we have a couple more episodes in between. And then the live show at Origins is going to be 560. And Tom and Eric and Mandy and I will all be on the show together. And it'll be a blast. Yes. So, and then cons. I know people keep asking. And I think it's great because we want to see all of you. Um, Origins is coming up. We will be at Dice Tower Con. Uh, what's after that? Gen Con. We will be at uh, Essen. I will be at Shucks, actually, um, helping out I'm Renegade jealous. Games. Uh, <laughs> That'll be so much fun. Oh, and uh, I know, right? Pax Unplugged, I think, is another one we're going to. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it. There might be a few little ones in between. I know I'm in Halifax. I, the name of it is uh, escaping me at the moment, but I'll be going to one in Halifax in September as well. So, yeah. And Busy then the year. Cruise. Yeah, it's, it's going to be nuts. So this is why we're so crazy. And I know Tom's traveling a lot right now. So podcast is kind of all over. But Which you are recording with Eric tonight, right? I am. In a few hours, I'll be recording with Eric. And we're going to be doing top 10 cooperative games. Your favorite. I'm so <laughs> glad I didn't have to do that episode. Yay. <laughs> so I got to write my script. I got to do that at some point. Um, but yeah, I'll be doing it with Eric. And this is our first one together. So I think it'll be a lot of fun. Hopefully I'm not overwhelming. Because I know Tom and I together are like, <laughs> it's amazing it's a good thing it's fun all I right everybody thank you so much for joining us it's always so much fun next time if we do one z q a again we'll try to announce it ahead of time so that we could have a chat onesie party too and we'll have to like get on twitter or on bgg and post photos of ourselves in our onesies <laughs> right mandy yes and oh brothers murph thank you i had to jump in so if everyone hasn't noticed already <laughs> My hair is no longer silver. It is blue. So thank you for all the kind words about the blue hair. We'll keep it for a while until I get bored and move on to something else. <laughs> all right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next time. We'll try to do a Q&A sooner than, I don't know. It's been a long time, Andy. Yeah, so we'll we try gotta... to do our next one sooner. Exactly. So thanks to the chat. You've been amazing as always. So Best fun. Best chat ever. Absolutely. And if have questions that you think of later or whatever, don't forget you can always email us. My email is Suzanne at Dicetower.com. And mine is Mandy, Mandy with an I, at Dicetower.com. <laughs> okay. So send us questions there as well. And until next time, bye. See you later.